This thing's freaking heavy. Oh, it doesn't even fit in the camera. Oh, twist it sideways and try not to crush my fingers in the process. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, that's big. Um, this is a SLA 100 amp hour. If I can move it over just a little bit. 12 volt 100 amp hour. Um, SLA battery from Windy Nation, which I've been using in my solar battery box, which apparently now for the last two years, the new buzzword is solar generator. So I guess I'm going to have to start calling it that. But this worked perfectly fine, but the problem is it weighs 71 pounds. It's too heavy. And it only has a couple hundred charge cycles on it. So we are going to replace it today. If I can pick it up again. Oh my god, it's so freaking heavy. Mm. Oh, if I don't knock over my uh, desk with it in the process. And we're going to replace it with that. That's so much better. So we're going to replace it with this battery. It's an EWT battery. That's the manufacturer of it. Uh, it has a built-in BMS. This is the lithium iron phosphate battery. Uh, made with 26650 batteries inside of it. 12.8 volts, which is kind of interesting. Usually it's 13.2 is their resting voltage, but hey, okay. Uh, 50 amp hours. Charging cutoff voltage is at 14.6 and the discharge at 10 volts. Not that I ever care to run it that low. But this is less than half the size of that battery and definitely less the weight. The lead acid that I just almost like completely killed myself on was 71 pounds. This is 15. And it's 50 amp hours. It's half the rating. But here's the catch. When you have a lead acid battery, you usually don't want to discharge it more than, say, 50%. Which, in this case, would be 50 amp hours on the 100 amp hour battery. Well, on lithium iron phosphate, you can pretty much use the whole capacity without damaging it. So, that's why I got a 50 amp hour battery instead. So, let's test it and see how good it is. Okay, so let's take off the negative cover and throw it around a little bit and let's see what the actual shipping voltage is because I literally just took it out of the box about five minutes before I turned on this camera so you're sitting at 12.48 volts which if I use my little cheat sheet right here for no load 12.4 is way too low this thing's actually sitting at 12.4 with no load yeah, 12.49, so it's practically discharged all the way. So we're going to have to give this a charge all the way up first, and then we'll do a capacity test and make sure nothing's damaged in here, and make sure we still get our 50 amp hours out of this. So let me get this set up for charging and move the camera around, and we will start charging it. Okay, so I got everything, the fans running, the power supplies over here for my bench power supply. I got the fan running on that. And we are set for 14.6 volts at 12.1 amps. That's the max that this unit can handle. So we're going to let this charge, and chances are it's probably going to take at least four or five hours to get this thing charged up. So let's turn it on. And yes, I still got to change out the fan in here, but at least I do have a secondary fan to help keep it cool. So now that we're charging, let's let it charge for about four or five hours, get it fully charged, and then I'm going to unplug it and let it sit for a minimum of 12 hours and find out what its new resting voltage is before we try putting a load on it and actually measuring it and seeing if it is still 50 amp hours or not. Okay, so I got the battery fully charged up and is now been sitting for about 15 hours or so. So let's see what the resting voltage is on this fully charged. And we are at 13.45 volts, which is like 95% charged. So what we're going to do is pull a load test on it. Now this is up to 60 watts, so we're basically going to be running around 4.5 amps pulling down. And this will measure how many uh, amp hours we get out of the battery. So the easiest way to start this is now it's starting. And under the load, we're already down to 1319, it says roughly. So let's see here. 1315. Yeah, see, even with the four wire Kelvin, it can't quite tell, but it'll still measure the amp hours that go through it correctly. So let's see how far down it goes and see what we get out of it. But we're getting practically no voltage sag already with a four and a half amp load on there. 
And just to verify that it is a four and a half amp load, let's uh, pull out the good old unity meter here and turn it on and see what we get off of it. Okay, zero it out. Snap on here. And let's see if I can pull it up enough so you can see. Yeah, there you go. Negative four and a half, because I'm on the negative line here. So yeah, four and a half amps. So yeah, we're definitely pulling the four and a half amps. So we're gonna let this run probably for, jeez, 50 amp hour battery at four and a half amps. This should at least take 10 hours to drain down correctly. So we'll come back when this is actually all done and see what the actual capacity of this battery really is. Okay, so that is finally done. And it's blinking like crazy saying that there is 49.53 amp hours in this battery. So let's see if we can let's see here, what hours? 634.6 watt hours. So let's get this battery recharged again and we will continue. Okay, so now that we know that this is a good battery and it does meet its capacity measurement, let's actually take a look inside. I was actually able to pop it open. It did have a nice amount of glue around the uh, plastic seam here, as you see of the little black area. Yeah, that's like the black tacky glue. And it took a little while to pry it open, but no problem. I actually got it open safely. Now there's a little, basically it's just an empty piece of PC board right here that they're using as uh, an insulator for the top of all these chips. Let's see if I can get this out here safely. There we go. And now you can see inside. Very good uh, solder job here. And uh, it looks like each one has six little spot welds on each one instead of the average four. I do see some little thermistors sitting around here, like right here, that's a little thermistor. There's actually a few of them sitting around in this box. Now what I do find interesting, before I get to the battery management system, which is on the top of here, you have these extra wires coming on down to this circuit board. And check this out. Anyone recognize that? Yeah, that's a Bluetooth module. They do sell this with a Bluetooth option that you can get onto your phone. This battery is not supposed to have that option, nor is it on the top of the cover. They put it on the top of the cover. Apparently they put it in whether they activate it or not. And I've already tried on my phone with whatever app I can find. This thing is not active right now. They just put it in here for whatever reason. So let's flip it on over here a little bit. And we can get to the battery management and let me refocus. This is definitely a low side on and off for it because you got the negatives coming off the batteries itself or off the battery pack. Going through all these switching MOSFETs and then going to the main negative terminal right here. Positive is fed directly from the battery cells itself. And you got this white PC board that everything's mounted on. It's also on a very good size heat sink back here as well. And it's a really thick, like two millimeter, uh, single sided aluminum PC board. They also have this blue board soldered on top of it, which has all the additional circuitry such as I had no clue what these two pins are for because it's not even being used. You have a five pin connector here, which is your balance leads for your 4S setup that you have here. All these extra wires seem to be going for the thermistor and for the Bluetooth. And everything over here seems to be populated. So I don't know how the heck to turn on the software or the hardware for the uh, Bluetooth unless it's actually in the software. Now we have two main chips here. One here is a Lapsus, L-A-P-I-S, and wipe it off again. I've already looked it up and I can't find anything on it. It says L-S-2-3-8-W. I pulled up like two or three web pages on Google and everything's either in Chinese or Japanese and won't translate. And even if it does translate a little bit, it doesn't even give a description of what this chip is. So I have no clue what it is. This one, on the other hand, is an NX NXP um, ARM microcontroller. I believe it's an M3. Let me double check here again real quick. Da, 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 da. Pull this up. It's on one of my windows here. And let's refocus here real quick. There we go. 
Yeah, it's an S9KEA-Z64AMLH, and that's the main microcontroller for this. 32-bit ARM M4, 64 kilobyte flash, 48 megahertz, and a QFP64 configuration. So that's what it's using as the main brain on here. You also have a breather at the top here. See that little white thing? It actually goes right to this little hole right there, and that's probably just to keep atmospheric pressure back and forth. There is another soft black thing that you saw on the top of the valve or top of the cover earlier, which is probably your overpressure valve. If for some reason one of these batteries blow and it can't keep up with the flow of air, that'll actually pop and allow, allow it to come on out. Okay, I actually found the BMS board on Alibaba and got some information on it, at least the way it's set out. They're saying that this one is good for 100 amps and... The thing is, the only thing I see different on it is these little pins down here at the bottom. These little jumper things, which uh, you can't see right now. There you go. Now you can see them. These little things down here, which also show up right here, they're showing them in pairs of twos. I have a lot more pairs on mine. Otherwise, the boards look exactly identical. If you scroll on down, this also has UART and RS-485 on it. And it gives you the basic information on the, let's see here, function description. Yeah, it has a sleep function. Uh, product picture, yeah, that's the exact unit that's in here right now. Uh, actually, this one is. See, now this picture has all of the uh, connectors, all those little silver jumpers on it. And the connectors, J3, this big long, long, bleh, this big long one right here. You can see the first five connections are for your Fourth battery is positive electrode, third battery is positive electrode, second battery is positive electrode, first battery is positive electrode, and first battery is negative electrode, packs negative electrode. That's the first five connections. Then the last four is a positive and negative for two temperature probes. J1, hey, what did you do that for? Uh, J1 is a two pin right here. That's your RS-485 port, which is not being used. J2, which is this one right here, that is your UART, which is what goes out to the Bluetooth module. So it's using UART to Bluetooth. And then the rest of the stuff, B minus over here, these are all your different connections that they have over here. So I think I'm going to end my review there. It seems to be probably a good battery pack. I mean, they're quality cells. They're welded on nicely. I don't see any schmutz or crap. And it's got a quality board in here from uh, smart-bms.com. As of right now, their website isn't working. But if you search for this style board on Alibaba, you can find it. Um, the only thing is I tried talking to it through RS-485. You can see I broke off the pins and soldered onto it and went to my RS-485 connector to the Windows software that I found for this. And it will not communicate. So... My guess is EWT disabled any type of communication to it, so I can't get into the board and actually make any modifications or anything. But regardless, it works perfectly fine the way it is. And for the cheapest 50 amp hour 12 volt battery that's in the continental US, it's actually a good battery. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below. And thumbs up, please, because I love lithium iron phosphate batteries. I'll see you next video.